now making 120 uh, rational CFT. Let's welcome them. <laughs> Thanks, Julius, for the invitation um, and very dedicated audience come here on to start the holiday with a business talk. Um, okay, so <coughs> I'm going to talk about the yeah, boundary of the green bridge phase and now I'm using 1 plus 1 CFT. And this is basically an extended version of my talk given uh, in September, a workshop here that was 20 minutes and this is. 90 minutes. Hmm? 90 minutes. It's 90 minutes. Well, <laughs> oh, I don't need that much time. But <laughs> you'll see. Um, okay, this was done. This is done in preparation with Dominic Williamson, who was a postdoc at Yale, uh, now at Stanford. Okay, so here's the outline of talk. So I'll first give an introduction to what problems I want to solve, and um, like the, give the flavor of the results, and then. Uh, I'll, I'll give a short review of sort of our quick description of block of faces 2D and then the gap boundaries. And then basically I'll add symmetry to the story and um, talk about so, symmetric gap boundary for a special class of states, not, not the most general cases. Then I'll use it to um, derive a kind of radical boundary expression CFT in one point. Here is uh, what uh, Yeah, it's it's a red. It's all about the that the only thing I can compute, so that was an important change from uh, what the talk I gave in September, if that was not made very clear, that what I can compute is the red economy, which will be made clear later. I will spend all the time. So, well, in recent years, we have made a lot of progress classifying gap faces in various dimensions. I think there's kind of a consensus that at least within the framework of the on field theory, we have an answer to this question of invertible faces. So, uh, broadly, we can divide all the gap faces into invertible ones and non invertible ones. Okay, so, since I'm going to just talk about low dimensional system, so this, this is only uh, what we know in 2 plus 1. Um, so in 2 plus 1, while there's, there are lots of invertible faces, but they are all characterized by a hierocentric charge. D plus IP is conductors, one call, and bosonic version of one call, the EA states. There are, of course, all these states with special lab excitations, which are non invertible in this language. Um, and for most of the talk, I was just restrict myself to bosonic states, and these are all described by a semantical structure called the uh, modular tensor category. I think I get information in this place, I can talk about the tensor category. And in addition, and there's a central charge. All the part is determined from modular tensor category, but the extra number uh, needs to be specified. Then, uh, if the system has a symmetry group, say, Let's just, let's just uh, assume the symmetry group is an uh, internal one and unitary finite is not too important, but let's, let's just make it easier. And then um, in 2 plus 1, we also have a good understanding of what's going on. So the invertible ones, besides all these faces with uh, characterized by central charge, higher central charge, the non chiral ones <coughs> also can be uh, also have non trivial faces, they are symmetry protected faces, and in 2 plus 1, they are all classified by group homology of G, right? Circle homology of G, as one coefficient. And the non invertible ones, now so they're called. So this E8 here and the E8, they are the same theory? It's, it's the same theory, right? You can just have an E8, and the symmetry doesn't do anything. It's still an interesting state, just by itself. And of course, you can, you can you know, tack on it various SPT bases. So on this side you have now what's called the G cross braided modular tensor category. Basically a uh, very detailed description of how symmetry can act in a modular tensor category. Okay, so uh, it's also very Question? yes. Is there a variant notion of the G cross braided modular tensor 
category? So in other words, if I give you a water sensing category, right. can you tell me whether there's a hidden structure or whether there's a symmetry in some category? Sorry, so your question is whether I have uh, so given the module has a category, yes. uh, given a symmetry right? I can have many different G class modules. Yes, but uh, if I give you a module, just one. So is the G class module category also a module that's a category? No, it's not. It's, not. Yeah. it's really a different kind of object. Yes. Uh, but then, no, you can further gauge the symmetry and make it a module that's a category. Larger. But it's uh, like a multi diffusion category? Uh, in a way, it's multi diffusion category. Yeah. but. We don't describe it this way. At least for this place, it's not necessary. It might be necessary if you if you, if you want to do like time process symmetry, but for unit symmetry, you don't need to. It's also well known and important that there's a nice group structure for invertible phases. So, uh, shot statement that the equivalent classes of all these invertible phases form a bidding group, and the group structure is given by stacking. Right. So the identity of the bidding group is just a trigger product state. And you can stack two faces on top of each other, and that gives you the addition operation in the group. And it's obviously a bidding. And the inverse is given by the complete phase. So for each phase, you can just basically take this time reversal image and put them together. It's going to be a trigger product state. OK, so um, if you have symmetry, then when we stack with two faces, we need to also have a symmetry acting on them um, in diagonal manner. So that's just a natural way to extend the symmetry on the two systems in the And the school structure, of course, you know, is given by um, well, the various, various ways to describe it. Well, without any symmetry, this is given by the um, oriented cobalism. And these are, the, you know, just to give an example, these are the, bad, these are the groups in uh, low dimensions. Z here is E8, and then the Z2 is a vertical phase in four positive Okay, but then the structure of non vertical phases is much less clear. Um, basically, you don't really have a group structure, and it doesn't really make sense to, to like, you can still stack two SDT phases together, but then it doesn't really give you a group structure. But there is still a group structure. You can Coming from stacking, uh, say, an invertible phase on the non vertical phase, you can always do that. So, say you have a symmetry reach throughout the phase with anions and various symmetry actions, you can always put on top of it uh, another symmetry protected phase that will not change anything about because, by definition, the symmetry protected phase has a trivial bulk. There are no anions, nothing interesting going on in the bulk, uh, in a sense. Uh, and so the bulk stays the same. However, we change the central chart. Well, not the central chart, but we change the boundary of this SCT phase. Okay, so the stacking does not change. In yeah. some cases, it's possible for the SCT to just dissolve the SCT, right? Yes, uh, that's it. <laughs> Is that the same way for the implementation of the hmm? Sorry? Is it also allowed for that? Uh, that that's, that's what I want to study why, when that happens. Right, so um, <coughs> as Tommy just said, sometimes. So in general, the staking does not change the bulk, but only affects the boundary physics. But sometimes it also, so, so in general, this is like a pulsar. Naively, it's a pulse over a group of SCT phase, SPT phases. So it's kind of a, a sloppy way of defining what pulsar means is that the group then just forgets its identity. Right? So the only thing you can do is to go from one element to another by ending an SPT. But then you don't really know which one is the trivial one. You know, they're all, there's always SCT, which is highly not okay. But it's not quite right, because um, sometimes it happens that you can step on an SPT to an SCT phase, but nothing happens. This, this thing stays the same, exactly the same. Not just the bulk is the same, the boundary is also the same. Okay. So all the, well, at least the existing classification doesn't really address this question. Okay. So at least from my knowledge, this was not really uh, taken care of. Just left there, so I want to um, get. So this is one problem that I want to address. And there, there's a similar phenomenon in three plus one. So for the gauge theories, can you explain the slogan again? I'm not sure. Oh. Well, so slogan is just that so the torso means there's a bidding group that acts. Okay, strictly speaking, torso means that a bidding group that acts transitively. Right. 
can go from one end to another by adding a probability. And then you don't know, we, we know which one's the identity. There's no identity. And the physics here that all you do is you stack on that on top of SCT phase and SCT phase. But then they're all in some sense SCT to begin with, like non trivial box, so we don't really know which one's trivial. None of them is trivial. So, so what do you mean is when SCT is trivial, we know what's identity for SCT, but when there's the SCT, we don't know what's yeah, you know, trivial it's hard to say for which the SCT one is, part. Yeah, it's hard to say which one is a trivial SCT. By trivial SCT, you mean the SCT with trivial SPT part? Well, so you cannot really clearly separate them. Yes, the yes, yes. I mean, so that's the, point. But, that's the point. But when there's no SCT, you can see. Yeah, yeah. When there's no SCT, then there's a canonical identity, which is the trivial product state. Right. And then you can define which one is the actual SCT. But with SCT, not only it generally becomes a tosser, and there's also this kind of you know, SCT absorbing SPT. Well, what is that? So symbol? this, so this, this uh, symbol just means stacking. So that oh. means stacking faces together. Okay, so there's a separate um, interesting sort of physical effect that can happen when the SCT can actually eat SPT. So this was first discussed in this paper by uh, Chen Di Wang and Michael Levy back in 2013. They called it weak symmetry breaking. Um, to not be confused with a, a similar term in the uh, 2006, 2006 paper appendix one of the appendix, he also defined weak symmetry breaking, but that, that's different. Um, so, so the phenomenon is the following. So, so in that paper, they consider the following setup. So you have a two-dimensional rock insulator here, PI, so the actual electronic rock insulator. And then they consider a boundary between the rock insulator with a so-called strong pairing state. So strong pairing state is a charge two equal pair, and you just put charge to pair into the one eighth locking state. And then to make it time reversal invariant, you also take a conjugate copy. So there's sort of like a spin one half Cooper pairs, um, but not really Cooper pairs. So there are like two component bosons which transform under time reversal into each other. Okay? And then you just form this kind of U1, one eighth and its conjugate by their system. So you consider the boundary between the TI and the strong pairing. Okay? So what they showed in the paper is that this boundary can be gapped without breaking any symmetry. On the other hand, the strong pairing phase thinks it's just what kind of bilayer with you know which each one is a time burst conjugate of the other, so you can easily gap it out when you have a boundary with a vacuum. Right, so now you can imagine I have this kind of a, a three uh, three layer system, or not three layer, but just like a TI and then surrounded by a strong pairing, and then have a boundary with a vacuum. And it seems like everywhere is gapped, and symmetry is preserved, at, at least on each boundary. So it was kind of puzzling, and they call this weak symmetry breaking, because if you look at each of these boundaries, there's no symmetry breaking at all. So we proved it uh, at, well, at the level of personalization. So just make sure TI is the SPT, and strong pairing is SCT? Strong pairing is SCT. So what happens is that symmetry must be broken because if you kind of shrink this strong pairing, or you just have an interface between TI and vacuum, and if it's gap, it must be uh, must be a symmetry breaking boundary. So what happens <coughs> is that there's a kind of a non-local order parameter. Wait, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. But <coughs> from TI to strong pairing, you break you break charge conservation. No. Sorry, you don't break charge conservation. You don't break charge conservation. So the strong pairing is <coughs> charge conservation. Right, so you have charge two equal pairs. Imagine just two electrons binding to equal pairs, and then the two pairs form blocking states. So that that's an uh, insulator. Yeah. So nowhere here I break, at least on the two boundaries, I'm not breaking any symmetries. So the symmetry is broken by a non order parameter. So that's why it's called weak symmetry breaking, because it, it's not broken by a strictly a local order parameter. Um, strictly speaking, not, nothing local. No other local <coughs> exists in the setup. And there's a non-local one, which is really a tunneling of some particle from one um, edge, a TI to strong pairing interface, 
for another edge, which is a strong pairing vacuum. And this auto parameter, this string operator as a whole, transforms uh, all the way under a time versus symmetry. So this guy breaks the time versus symmetry, not anything local on the two boundaries. So this was called weak symmetry breaking. <coughs> this is just to illustrate you know, kind of a thing that can happen if you think about interface between SPT bases and SCT bases, somewhat counterintuitive. So what I yeah so it's not strictly speaking a strong pairing state so this is like time versal version of strong pairing so I have say spin up pool pairs and spin down pool pairs so one of them is a minus one one base block and the other one is a conjugate so <coughs> time versal just swaps the two things right? so not really like a single layer strong pairing state but they still use this term. Okay, so uh, since in that example, oh, sorry. Yeah. <coughs> so just the, there's a line operator W. Yes. From the U1 level A and U1 level minus A, right. 3D transign. Right. So what's that line operator? Uh, I think that's a two comma two particle. Okay. Combined with something like. <coughs> well, sorry. So um, yeah, it's it's essentially a tunnel of two two from one edge. And, and it's a bosonic. It's a bosonic. Right. But then um, I'm not you know, I'm not telling you all the detail about what was what the quantum numbers do. Okay. Roughly speaking, that's it. <coughs> okay. So uh, in that example, the symmetry was time reversal because it was Ti. Um, so there was a there's a, another similar example where um, I can replace the Ti with something. Uh, very similar, but now the symmetry is a unit raising too. So I simply don't have to permute the two layers of the strong pairing. But then the rest goes through exactly in the same way almost. So if there's a similar example where the TI replaced by a Z2 to Boska superconductor, I mean, can I actually preserve you one there? So, so, so let me draw this picture. So um, here I have this, uh, roughly that was a TI in the Previous slide, but here this was a, it's a like superconductor protected by just a unit resistance to symmetry. And then it's uh, in proximity with uh, this kind of a double transignment series. This interface is gapped, and the other side can also be gapped. Then you have a similar weak symmetry breaking. Now, in this case, the symmetry X internally on each of these layers, they don't permute layers. So if you think about this, if you just fold this kind of a uh, SPT to one of these layers, for this to happen, it must be the case that this U1 level 8, one of them, has to be able to kind of just eat the super, the box superconductor, in this case, this particular SPT, and nothing happens. Right? So it has to be able to kind of absorb it without changing the boundary so that you can actually get out the other side to have a, a weird example of this kind. So whenever you have SCT that can sort of just it's a SPT, you can form an example of a big symmetry breaking where there's no local symmetry breaking. So this was a kind of a related phenomenon. Uh, another one that's also related is uh, which has been discussed um, quite extensively in the past few years is a gap surface of a 3 plus 1 SPT basis. Okay. So just to be uh, concrete, let's say that bulk symmetry is a product of two groups, G1 and G2, right? So, um, so there's this decorative domain wall construction of a bulk SPT wave function. Basically, so first imagine breaking the symmetry, say spontaneously, and you, know, you can have various domain walls of your symmetry group. And then on these domain walls, which is co-dimensional one, you can imagine decorate, decorating lower dimensional symmetry protected faces with the remaining symmetry, right? the domain wall breaks some part of the symmetry and then some, the other part of the symmetry remains and then you can stack on the, or you can decorate on the uh, SPT of the remaining symmetry. So let's say the bulk, in the bulk we sort of imagine, imagine a wave function which is superposition of domain walls which breaks one of these symmetry, two groups, so break the G1 then G2 remains even on the domain wall, so you can 
stacked on a G2 SVT state. And then you imagine proliferating this domain of quantum disorder in the state to restore the G1 symmetry. Okay, so this, this, this construction shows up in the cohomology classification as one term in the Kunis decomposition. You can always do this, basically, as long as the blue structure is compatible with each other. Um, now, let's just think about the surface of this particular SPT phase, you know, constructed out of decorated domain walls. Now, suppose the surface is kept and preserving all the symmetries, both G1 and G2, and imagine that a G1 domain wall, you know, you can have a domain wall in the bulk and just end on surface, right? Now you have a surface, otherwise the domain wall must be closed in the bulk, but now they can terminate on the boundary. Then further, if the boundary actually preserves the symmetry, you should be able to just intuitively, you should be able to just kind of push the domain wall entirely to the boundary and nothing really happens. So this this is this should be true if the, if the boundary is gapped and symmetry is preserved. So what that means is that the surface must be able to kind of absorb this SPT that is decorated on the domain wall because you can kind of push the domain wall to the boundary and nothing happens. So that just means the surface has ability to just kind of absorb that SPT. And of course, in this case, after symmetry transformation, because domain wall, once you push the domain wall to the boundary, it's like acting the symmetry to that region of the boundary. Oh, sorry. So the G1 domain wall means G1 symmetry breaking domain wall. Yes. And G2 SPG means preserve the G2 symmetry. Right. So G1 symmetry breaking domain wall put into G2 preserving SPG can be absorbed. Means the means the the G1 is still breaking. Right. Well, so I'm really thinking about a symmetric bulk, but then the wave function in the bulk is like superposition of all such kind of domain walls. Right. So if the bulk is such a symmetry preserving well, proliferation of proliferating domain walls, then you should be able to just kind of absorb domain walls onto a boundary. Right. So that's like one term in the superposition of the whole weight function. Um, right, so I'm, I'm talking about domain walls because that's easier because but really you know, this is a symmetric state. But but you want a symmetry is broken? On the boundary, yeah. Well, okay. If you if you oh, freeze no, no. all the spins and look at one configuration, it's broken. But then it's really a superficial wall. Yeah. Okay. I still don't get why surface must be able to absorb G two S Why? Well, the, the, the heuristic argument is that you know, this G one domain wall, you can have it permanent on the boundary, but then you should also be able to push the whole thing to the boundary. Remember, this G1 domain wall actually carry, carries a low dimensional G2 SPT. Yeah. So you should be able to kind of push it onto the surface, but then the surface still stays the same. Right. There's no, no, there's no gapless modes emerging on this you know, fictitious boundary of the domain wall of the surface. Right. On the circle, there's no gapless stuff. But, but wouldn't you have different Different like G2 SPT for all different domain walls? Yes, but then yeah, because it should be compatible with the roof structure. Right. Oh, so at the boundary it should be just C2, single G2 SPT, single G2 SPT. No, the boundary is SPT in this case. Whatever the boundary state is get, it has to be able to kind of take in that SPT and just stay the same. Okay, so um, that was, a, for example, the Fermionic example was uh, given in this paper uh, by that's the first author, okay, Lucas Max and Ashley last year. Okay, so all these different no, situations are <coughs> pointing to the kind of the same phenomenon that is SCT can actually uh, solve SCT. Sorry about that paper. You but it was fermionic SPT. Uh, yeah, the surface of fermionic supercomodus. Sorry. You push the G2 SPT to the boundary. So the boundary has some SPT. So How sorry, the boundary is SPT, right? It's gas. So I have this domain wall, G2 as domain wall pushed to the boundary. It's the SPT at that point. How I can see that it becomes an SPT? 
do it, it doesn't become STT, right? So you already have STT on the boundary. Then by doing this, you kind of add STT to parts of the boundary. But then no, this, this part, this region where you actually stack on the SPT, should still have a gap interface with the rest. And uh, just right. for hosting to stay gaps. I am sobbing you mean there's no phase transition when you have this. There's no phase transition okay. in the bulk. And when you have an uh, interface between, say, this outside region where you don't put on SPT, and the inside region where you actually stack on SPT, there should be, there should be no gap transition. The thing is, uh, if you just think about a single component of the wave function for the stack rate domain mode construction, uh, this should make sense. But I mean, this is happening as a whole wave function. So, like, as a whole wave function, I mean, we know that boundary is SCT, as you said, but when we inspect just a local patch, local component, why, why, whether this should hold or not, it's unclear to me. Uh, well, I think if you really have a symmetric wave function in the bulk, right? So this should, should this should hold because the boundary, the, the boundary, the surface preserves the symmetry. Right? So mean that you can kind of locally get rid of this dummy wall. But the symmetry breaking means that you actually change a lot on the boundary. Because because if you just consider a local component, it already breaks the say G1 symmetry. Well, yes. So whenever I, I, I draw this picture, I mean that I freeze all the spins, right? So, for that, for that snapshot, I break G1 symmetry. And not G2. On that, not G2. Not G2, right? Yeah. G2 is still there. But then the whole wave function is a superposition of all such states. Yeah. So the so whole wave function, I, I understand the surface is like that state. So you can imagine, you try to write down this decorate domain wall wave function yes. state with a boundary. Okay. You have to suppose you know, these different states differ, differing from each other just by kind of absorbing the domain wall to the boundary, yeah. right? Then you don't want to just change the SCT on boundary. Okay. You want to still pull the same kind of SCT on boundary. Okay. Any point doesn't like this decorate domain wall argument, you can probably just argue by take the actual state of the system and insert the G1 symmetry defect. Yeah, that, that would be our last argument. Right. That would also be it. Another, so another way to see the same thing, well, another example to see kind of similar effect is to actually say use the strategy in this paper. Say instead of thinking about uh, internal symmetry SPT, you think about the crystalline symmetry. For example, translation. And in that case, the picture becomes this, right? So in the bulk, you have just a stack of uh, different SPTs, and on surface, this is what you have on surface. Let's say you have some kind of stuff on the surface, right? So these are some SPT space, some 2D stuff. They are all related by translation along this direction. Let's call it X. Now, if you look at this junction here, so you essentially have the same thing that I do on earlier slides. So this is some SCT, another SCT. Same SCT because they are related by translation symmetry. But then here, there's a SPT city on, on this kind of a tri junction. Right? So you can kind of fold it to either side, and then it should be the same. It's essentially the same as what I was trying to show on this slide. Just to make sure, so when you say the surface must be able to observe the G2S step, do you refer to a particular generator for the circle module group, or is there any of them? Uh, it be, well, there's a particular thing that we decorate on that's the right. one, right? But when you say the, the last state, it will be particular. Oh, yeah, the, the one that's decorated on the component model, not, not in the Okay, so that's, uh, well, I didn't say anything about CFT, but I want to say later, so I think I don't have to do it with the moment. All right, so now uh, let me go to a more formal kind of description of a topological phase. So these are kind of, a, basically I want to understand what, how to uh, kind of systematically check this phenomenon of SCT eating the SCT phase. Okay, so uh, algebra theory of the quantum topological phase that I will use in this talk is a model tensor category, and the nickname is Enyon model. Um, okay, so in this in this theory, I we describe anions as uh, simple objects, anion types as simple objects in the model tensor category. So just collection a collection of different types of anions, and we all know that anions are basically 
super selection sectors of polyphonic excitations uh, up to low operators. So you have some labels in this set, label set A, B, C, they're just labels, different types of anions, and then they can fuse. So there's a confusion loop between the anions. So you can fuse A with B, you get some other anion dots uh, with a coefficient which are uh, non negative integers. Okay. And Anions can break non trivially with each other. So there are two kinds of processes that we usually think of. Think about one is a bottle twist or uh, exchange statistic between two anions. And the other one is an aspect twist. So what happens if you move one anion around another? Okay. So a more useful point for the later part of talk is what's called a scalar component of the modern drop homodromy. It's basically SAB um, star because of this particular orientation I choose on two circles uh, with some normalization. Okay. So it turns out to be the total quantum dimension divided by the dimension of the end. So, so the usefulness of this quantity is that when this quantity is 1, you really say A and B have trivial break. If you look at S matrix, it might be non, non zero, it might be some weird number coming from normalization, but then if you get rid of all these normalization factors, then A B equals 1 means the gradient is trivial. So that's kind of useful. What kind of symmetry is you using to twist the spin? Uh, so we just name. This just means you take a spin and then rotate like two times. There's no symmetry. It's not a ball symmetry twist. This was if we use asymmetry to twist the spin. So, so that's my question. Well, I think it's it's coming from probably coming from Dan twist. Uh, but then let's just say this is the name. <laughs> Has nothing to do with symmetry twist at the moment. It's not so simple. Yeah, it's not so easy. Sorry, yeah, that's not a question. It's not. It's not so easy. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, yes, I, I am aware of this a similar term in n equals two Sudi, but this has nothing to do with that. It's just only spin statistics. Yeah, it basically means spin statistics relation. Okay, but then um, on top of these more kind of critical observables, uh, we also have a subtler set of data which are f and r symbols. So. In particular, in the anion theory, uh, you can define this splitting fusion space that tells you kind of super selection sector when you try to, or local operators when you split this C into A and B. Now, this is the Hilbert space, and then you can form a fusion tree between three anions, you can fuse in two ways, and they should really give you the same Hilbert space up to a basic transformation. And the basic transformation is called F symbol. Uh, and you can also define R symbol of just fixing the fusion channel A and B and then exchange them. Now A and B don't have to be the same. So there's the redundancy, but um, really not, not really important for my purpose. And these F and R symbols have to form a consistent structure, so they have to obey what's called the Pentagon and hexagon equations. So, but then no other condition are needed. Once you satisfy these two, the whole theory is consistent. Of course, uh, to be really careful, we need to put a few more adjectives in front of uh, categories. Like it has to be unitary, of course. I'm not going to talk about what are the conditions. <clears throat> okay, so this this is this is without symmetry. But now let's say we have a symmetry, we have a global symmetry, and, and uh, we're going to assume it's finite and unitary, and internal symmetry. Also, you know, from the work of Dominic and Brian. We know that similar things can be done for crystalline symmetries. Okay. So the structure is called G crossed gradient anti category. So the mathematical structure was really <coughs> well the classification was the mathematical classification was really done in this paper. Uh, commonly commonly referred to as E, N, and O in this community. And then uh, you got a physic reference for physicists. Alright, so I'm going to just deal with bosonic systems. So, <clears throat> very roughly, we need to specify, so given some M module tensor category, that's anion, the content, anion content without symmetry, and given a global symmetry G, we can classify all the different SED bases or G cross graded tensor category in terms of three pieces of data. So, one of them is a map of G2 kind of automorphism of this category. And then there's additional uh, cohomology data that you have to specify. And then some obstruction classes have to vanish for this to be really critical. 
Okay, so let's look at each of these, these uh, three pieces of data more carefully. So first, automorphism. Um, so I, in my definition, this out of C is just all the permutations of anions that leave physical observables invariant. Okay, so necessarily, they have to be the fusion rules and S and T, so grading data invariant, but that's not sufficient. Sometimes you can, you can have all of them the same, but then still not by a legit legitimate automorphism, but anything. Anyway, you have to leave all the physical properties invariant. So roughly speaking, they have to preserve, say, the fusion, theta, and S as a necessary condition. We can write a more precise, sufficient, and necessary condition for that in between here. So this this all this, the set of permutations obviously form a group, and uh, we call it topological symmetry group of this Pena model. So this is a symmetry of the module tensor category without any reference to the microscopic details. Right? It's just a symmetry that you can figure out by staring at the set of you know, data you have for the module tensor category. And this is always a discrete because they're just permutations of any labels. Okay. So if you have a global symmetry, uh, obviously it must induce a homomorphism from your global symmetry group G to this automorphism group. So it might just be trivial. It might just be that this whole G is mapped to the trivial identity element, not prohibiting any influence. Sometimes it could be not trivial. So on top of that, so you can pick a row. Right? So that tells you how the symmetry and symmetry transformation permutes different anions. Um, on top of that, one also has to think about how symmetry acts locally on each of these anions because anions are localized excitation. They're not local, but they're localized. Away from these anions, everywhere else looks like ground state. So you can imagine if you really uh, transform this state with a bunch of anions by global transformation, well, they should be kind of localized around each of these anions, at least in the sense of operator relation, operator algebra, uh, local operator algebra. So, so roughly, we can write a global transformation on such a kind of state as a product of the you know, local operators near each anion you have in the system, plus some something global that acts on fusion space, just to take care of permutation. So that's a complication that arises when you have uh, I'm sure permutation of anions. But um, for most of the talk, I've just set row to one, so you don't have to even worry about this. So because the global symmetry, of course, the global transformation have to form a you know, faithful regular representation of symmetry group. But each of these individual guys, they don't have to. Right? They can just transform projectively. So when you multiply them, they don't. When you multiply G and H, the local version of G and H on each of any they don't have to give you exactly G H. Up to, they can differ by a, a few one phase. How do you span get on with instance of row of G? this row of G. So row of G just tells you, so, so, um, so I didn't really write an actual state. So when you have a bunch of anions, right, so there's a fusion space. So you a bunch of other stuff in the middle to take the end. So to, to really say, I and mean, this is vacuum at the bottom, so there's a fusion state global fusion state related to this state. Right? So when anions are permuted, it means that the symmetry also acts on this fusion state. And that part is captured by this high row. And these U's only take care of the local action. So um, U will give you, say, what happens if you act, if you conjugate by a local operator, conjugate local operator near, say, any of A of J by the global symmetry. That will, be take, that will be taken care of by this view. But then this global action, when the row is non trivial, still has to be kind of kept track of separately by this row. <clears throat> so that, that kind of makes the story a little more complicated. But <clears throat> uh, in the case when anions are not permuted by symmetry, so set row to one, then you, know, you can forget about all these rows here. And then this a, a part is a face generated by a gradient anion around. Um, you know, whatever anion we are looking at, gradient abelian anion around anion we're looking at. So and the reason that it's a big anion is because this guy is a face. And um, right now, probably better should call this a one-form symmetry. But I prefer to use a small pedestrian way. 
minutes when we talk about stretch validation. So these spaces are generated by just creating a billion anions around uh, anion A, and these billion anions are just determined by the group M and GMH. You can all, always find such a billion anion once you've given these spaces. And then once you demand assertivity between the symmetry, localized symmetry actions, these local iteraries, uh, you can find that these billion anions actually form a two cycle. So it's an element of this group, which are two, second whole module G, with coefficient in the group of abelian anions in module tensor characteristics. So A is a billion, consists of all abelian anions. So roughly speaking, we encode this whole set of data in this abelian anion value co cycle W. And then you can go back to the phase by just braiding this W with around A. Okay. So it's really equivalent in the case of rho equals one. When rho is not equals one, then um, in that case, it's only a toss-up, but let's, let's not worry about this. Okay, so, uh, so so far it's just a symmetry action in the module tensor category, but the G-crossed really, really tells you how to build defects. So you can see cross symmetry defects uh, or fluxes of this global symmetry in the module tensor category, and there are different kinds of defects with the same branch cut labeled by element G, but the endpoint may be different. So they collect all defects, all different kinds of types of defects with the same G into one G sector, and then form a, a larger set of objects consist of all these defects together with the anion, and this is called the G cross gradient category. Of course, no, that's vacuous if you don't encode structure, so. Um, can fuse the defects, that means you fuse the endpoints, also fuse the branch cut carried by the defect, and obviously the branch cut fuse is multiplication of group. So this is called a graded fusion rule, meaning that if you fuse something from the G sector with something from H sector, you should get something in the GH sector. Then you can also break defects around each other, it's called G cross braiding. But anyway, it's, it's a little different from usual braiding when any other familiar. Um, but you can still make sense of it, and then this whole thing, together with all the consistency conditions, give you the G cross grade you can. So, um, so the kind of input to this category that you choose some row, and then you also have to choose some kind of a fresh annotation class. Then you, know, you can try to solve all the equations to get this whole category, the G cross grade category. But this is not always possible. Sometimes you hit obstruction, and obstruction is captured by a Homology class of obstruction class in uh, which of four G comma one U one and obviously that tells you that there's a two tonality in the theory because this kind of a, you know, adding defects to theory is really one step in gauging the whole symmetry. It's equivalent to introducing a background gauge field, couple and coupling your system to a background gauge field. These are just defects basically. Um, then if you cannot do it, mean that you have a total nominee. That's a definition of total nominee. And then you can put it on the surface of a 3D SVT given by this obstruction class. So the computation of this class, uh, in the case of rho equals one, was done first in this paper by Xie, Lukács, Fiona, and Ashwin. Um, when any other permuted, uh, these two later papers write a formula for the computation of this class. Anyway, when obstruction vanishes, means that there's no tokenomy for the SVT, and then so that's always a case that you have obstruction, and when it vanishes, you have different solutions corresponding to a lower homology. That means you have torsor of which of three, G comma E1, which are just stacking SPTs in your SPT base. So this is, of course, this last part is obvious, always there. But it doesn't really tell you whether it's the same or not. Just mean that you can change your solutions to the G cross gradient category by a trickle cycle. But whether it's the same one or not, it's not obvious. So um, there's a whole family of SCT bases just from groups extension. So you can identify simple structures already from an extension of groups. So um, let's see. Maybe I should skip this. So, all right, so now I want to go to gap boundaries. So gap boundary for Logical phases, sort of the same as a condensation of anions, 
So not only we can talk about the topological phase itself in terms of modular tensor category, we can also kind of study transition out of this phase by thinking about any optimization, and not all the transition, but a, set of, a particular set of transitions out of this phase by condensing certain bosonic mediums. All right, so uh, gap boundary. Okay. So gap boundary can arise, can exist, yeah, but only if you have enough bosons to condense. So if you can find enough bosons to condense to kill the whole block of phase, then you have a gap boundary. That also means you can condense these bosons to transition out of this product phase to a triple phase. And it's not enough to just say that these are bosons. Obviously, they have to create tributary with each other so that they can form condensate. But then, um, that, even that is not enough. So the more precise term that these bosons have to form a Lagrangian algebra, just all the conditions you need to make sense of this condensation. Um, and formally, we write this L, the Lagrangian algebra, as kind of sum of the bosons you condense. Okay, but this sum is the same sum you, you see, let me just say this first, the same sum you see when you write the fusion rules, that's kind of the direct sum between the companions. And then I weigh them with a coefficient n of a, so when n of a is greater than zero, it means that that boson is condensed. Otherwise, it just means that the particle is not condensed. So the condensation implies symmetry breakout of well, so so far I'm not. I don't have symmetry. I don't have symmetry yet. Okay. Sometimes it implies symmetry. So if n of a is zero, it's greater than zero. Then the, this n of a condenses on boundary. It must be a boson. So this n of a most of the time is one, but that have to be one. Sometimes it's more than it's two or even higher. Now um, I'm not going to describe the general theory. So these were laid out in. Sorry. What does it mean for n bigger than one? Uh, <laughs> yes, I don't. I don't really want to get into that. But I can that, ask. Later. Yeah, that that happens actually. Say uh, simply, but let me give one example where that happens. So if you think about the, the S three H theory, so we can think about the, the Higgs transition out of S three H theory. So just the Higgs symmetry breaking, so breaking the whole S three down to nothing. That in that case, it turns out that you have to con the equivalent to condensing all the G charges in the S3 case theory, right? So that's just what it means to have a symmetry breaking. And you have to condense all of them. Um, so if you think about the representation of S3, so the charges of case theory is given by the wraps of S3. So there are three of them, of course, the, the identity of the trivial wrap and then the alternating wraps, just given signs. And there's a two dimensional wrap. So if you try to write this object in terms of these three refs, you have to put a two in front of the two-dimensional ref. So, um, mean that when you when you bring this particle to the boundary, there's sort of a, a channel that you know, tells you there are different ways you can annihilate this particle the boundary. Very much logically distinct ways of doing That's the best thing I can do. Okay, so there's a theorem that say, that says if you have a Lagrangian algebra in MTC, meaning that you can have gap boundary, um, then this, this can only happen if this is a dream field center in the physical term. Physics, uh, the large dream field center just being the, some kind of generalized string net construction, having one model, superly generalized. So if you are really interested in this whole theory, you can read uh, the Holmes paper. All right, so just to give an example, so we all, we all know and love particle, C particle, right? So the lattice, the model of square lattice where each edge has a two-dimensional Hilbert space, a qubit, then just write two terms. One is the product of x on the edges around one vertex, and then all the z's around four edges um, of one black edge. Okay, so you can create two anion. There are two types of basic Anyon, so one is uh, kind of a Z2 flux, you can build this a Gauss law, this is a V square term of a Z2 K theory. So if you apply a string of X of, on these bounds, on the dual lattice, you create two M excitations, two plus X excitations. If you can apply a string of Z's along the edges, then you get two E excitations. There are four of them, so one, the vacuum, E, M, and bound state, which is the fermion. They're all Z2, so it's a really easy to be neutral. 
Okay, so there are two types of gap boundaries for the Z2 page theory, corresponding to a confinement transition and page transition, uh, respectively. So one type of boundary is what's commonly called a smooth boundary. It just means they kind of terminate the model in the most natural way. Don't do anything weird, just terminate the boundary. And now the plaquette terms stay the same, but then you have to, you know, now you have to write a term with three x on the uh, boundary for x. But that's fine, you can do this. And then you can see that M can now just go away, can exit out of the bulk from the boundary because this string can just terminate the boundary and nothing happens. So M can just go away. So that means M condensing the boundary, but then the boundary output for this boundary is 1 plus M. And this corresponds to a confinement transition. So the other side of the boundary, well, on the other side of the boundary, that's kind of a trivial phase where you condense the flux, so that's a confinement phase. Um, Another boundary is kind of a, called a rough boundary, uh, where you have edges sticking out of the boundary. So these, the dash line is not there, so they're just edges sticking out. So now these uh, vertex terms take their full form, but then the plaquette terms near the boundary miss one edge. So now what you can do is you can drag an E particle just to the boundary and then disappears. So that means E can condense the boundary. And uh, on the other side of the boundary, it's kind of a trivial phase induced by a page symmetry, break that page symmetry. In case we can also analyze it from a field theory. Um, well, so, so we know that we can describe a bulk by a P1 cross P1 transignment theory. So it's, it's E and E are two compact P1 page fields, and then you write this transignment term, a mutual transignment term ADB, with one over pi in front. In terms of k matrix, you zero to zero. And we know that transignments, this kind of Abelian transignments series, can have an edge described by a Lattinger liquid. So in this case, you need two component Lattinger bonds. It's one component, but it's two bosons. And you know, basically, it's the time derivative of one times the space derivative of the other. That's a topological term. And then these two bosons are not mutually local, so there's a kind of anti-mutation between them between different points, the vertex operators. So local op operators on this edge are the densities of these bosons plus kind of the creation of two of them because of these anions are Z2 like. So the Zinotian liquid is generally not stable, so we can add this kind of a instability term that induces instability towards a gap term, gap phase. So we have to write them in terms of local operators, so it's either cosine 2 pi of 1 or cosine 2 pi of 2. So if you only have, say, cosine phi 1, then this term will kind of ping phi 1 to some kind of a minimum of the cosine potential, then phi 1 is pinged. And if you have the other, then phi 2 is pinged. That corresponds to two types of gap boundaries you have part of code. Which one you call E and M is a it's kind of natural convention. All right, so now we want to have symmetry. So um, it seems like I'm really going to use a full one hour clock. <laughs> so that was a question that I um, already asked. So what, what happens you know, if you have symmetry? Right? Some anion condensed transition might just break the symmetry. So uh, if you just think about what kind of conditions you need to impose to not break the symmetry, there are two kind of obvious conditions. One is that this whole set of anions that condense, you know, the set, the label set should not be changed under a symmetry. Right? So this Laplacian algebra should be invariant. Otherwise, you just break the symmetry on the face. You just explicitly break the symmetry. Um, when that doesn't happen, you have a chance of preserving the symmetry, but you have to make sure that there's no local out parameter. So you can build out of this uh, Lagrange algorithm. So the first condition that you know, the set of condensed anions should be invariant under a row. So otherwise, you just already break the symmetry by hand by choosing that Lagrange algebra. And when this is case, um, it turns out they have to, this is probably obvious from, for many of you, that you, you have to make sure that there are no projective symmetry actions on the rows, these, well, on the L's, so this anion that you condense on boundary should not carry any, say, sigma half. And by projective rep, you mean uh, the cohomogeneous P1 coefficients? Uh, with both A coefficients. Yes. Like some of those are not, not actually not real projective reps. Yeah, not actual on this projective rep is one. Right? 
but stainless steel, it will also induce in breaching. Right. So generally, when that happens, you can find some composites of tape that will give you a local order parameter breaking the symmetry. So in that case, the best you can do is that you can have a spontaneous symmetry breaking, but still have symmetry breaking. Then, once you make sure that these things don't happen, uh, now you can have a gap boundary preserving all the symmetries, or you can have a symmetric condensation out of the phase. But then there are some choices you can make. So you can make the anions carry one dimensional wraps under the symmetry. By the terms, probably the anions can be charged under the symmetry. But in that case, although the anions are charged, because the anions are not local, you can, you can choose the representations in the right way to make sure that no local no local parameter exists in the symmetry. So that's, uh, that means you can have a kind of a condensation that is charged on the symmetry, but still no actual symmetry is broken. Um, I think I probably somehow skipped the whole thing. <laughs> so I want, okay, so this is kind of the only gap boundary I'm going to consider in this whole talk. That is, I take some 2D product face and I just fold it to form a five layer system. And then I view this kind of this side where I fold it is a gap boundary between formed on the interface of C together with uh, the conjugate of C with a vacuum. So this is a gap boundary. Of course, you can always have a gap boundary for such a bilayer system. So there's a very natural gap boundary in such a bilayer system. And if you think about what, what actually condenses the boundary, is just the fact that you can take one anion on the top, bring it all the way to the bottom layer. So that means this kind of pair, AA, one from the top, one from the bottom, actually condenses the boundary. Just another way of saying you can you can take this A and bring it all the way to the bottom, or bottom A. And if you have symmetry, we also demand that because it's really the same thing but then folded, so they, they should have offset, whatever data they have. <clears throat> now, um, no, this you don't need to call it A bar. No, it's not A bar. It's just A for the C is C. Well, A bar is really reserved for the antiparticle of A, the U of A. Here is not a geometry, it's just A on the other layer. Maybe you should call it universal image of A on the other layer. I don't need hypersal image, but it's obviously it can't preserve. Now suppose that this anion that I'm condensing actually carries a one-dimensional wrap, some kind of charge under the symmetry. So so if you if you want to make sure that no symmetry is broken spontaneously, you make sure that identity sector of local objects are all neutral under the symmetry. So that translates into a requirement that um, these one-dimensional wraps have to kind of multiply as a fusion. If you can fuse, say, A is B to get C, the label attached to this anion A comma A, the, uh, the run E wrap attached to this anion should also kind of multiply to give you, say, label on C. And um, then you can just use kind of the same logic used to classify fertilization to show that these guys are given by abelian anions. And then the fact that they have to just multiply, well, they have to form a representation group tells you this abelian anion has to multiply this kind of function. The abelian anion is really a homorphism from group to the set of abelian anions. So in conclusion, the charge condensate is really specified by map from a G to the set of abelian anions. And A is a group of anions. Preserving ages for abelian anions. Okay, so we can classify all such charge condensates that preserve the symmetry. It's given by a simple map from the G to the set of abelian anions. That tells you which quantum number is carried by this kind of condensate anion, kind of condensate anion A comma A. Just by A. Okay. Sorry? Uh, is it A or is it A star? Well, it's a matter of convention, which one you choose. Uh, I think yes, right? So I, I choose a particular convention to, to write the equation this way. Phi is m star a comma b comma b. But if you choose the a in the other layer, then you would have you have to remove that star. Then that, that you can kind of interchange. The reason that yes. Okay, so now. This is kind of a, <laughs> the result. 
I'm not really give a derivation. Uh, that will require another 15 slides. Um, I should make them. It's not enough to talk about it. Okay, so, so now this is sort of the, the SCT absorbing SPT boundary, right? So you have this kind of a bilayer folded SCT. So the top one is an image of the bottom one. So it's the same SCT, but now we demand that there's a fully gap and symmetry preserving interface from this bilayer system to some kind of SPT phase. So the question is when this happens. So it turns out um, I have to make some assumptions. For example, I'm, I'm not considering a case where anyons are permuted, and actually on the boundary, you can actually have some kind of a permutation of anyons, but again, I'm setting that trivial. So in this, under these assumptions, one can derive a formula for what kind of SPT, SPT on the other side in terms of the bulk uh, pressurization data, this W, two cosine, remember, back 10 slides ago, I defined this W of H of 2, G comma A, together with a boundary um, one call cycle that tells you which anions carry which charge. So there's a simple formula that tells you what kind of SPT you have to put on the other side of the system if you want to condense the anions according to this kind of a one dimension graph that carries one dimension graphs. Okay, so it really consists of two pieces. Each of them is a legitimate one three call cycle. So the first one is the F symbol of V, G, and H. Uh, and then the other one is a braiding of fractionization cycle with the anion beam. And that, that has a simple interpretation. So imagine we think about the symmetry defect in on this side in the CT phase. And let's say the other side is actually trivial. So we just fold them and nothing really happens. There's no there's nothing really nothing really exists on the other side. Uh, or I can say there's a trivial state here. Now I can pull the defect Across this boundary, because the boundary is assumed to be gapped and preserving on symmetry, so we can freely move the defect in and out of this SCT phase across the boundary. Okay, so that I can do, I can just drag it out. Wait, so it's a G defect, two G defects? No, well, it's one G defect, but the G acts on both layers, so it's like one flux penetrating two layers. Yeah, that's why I draw it this way. But now, if I actually condense some anions, well, there's always this A comma A anions condensed on boundary, but then suppose now they carry some charge, carry some random right graph. So you cannot just drag this kind of bare anion or bare defect out because you know, they may not actually be happy with the charges carried by the anions condensed on boundary. So what happens is that you actually have to attach the anion to this defect. And then you can happily, this, this guy can happily exit this SCT phase without causing any disturbance on the boundary. Okay, so now you can drag this whole thing out. So the physical meaning of this V is basically, you, know, this, you have to attach this additional building anion to your defect if you, if you try to move the defect out to the trivial phase. But now, the defect in the, on the trivial side inherits, for example, the F symbols of the anion. That's why you see this piece of F here. But also inherits, for example, whatever the projective ref carried by this anion B. That's why you have this M here. The M gradient between W and B tells you what projective ref carried by B. So that's, and in the end, you just get a product of these two. So that's a kind of a heuristic explanation why you get this formula. All right, so uh, the only proof I have for this formula is based on an explicit construction boundary kind of string net model. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to present it here. Okay. So just to give some examples, so first let's take this category to be like the simplest more defense category you can ever imagine, the semion theory. Okay. And here the data on semion theory it's so very simple that you can write it down just in one line. And of course if V is one then this whole thing is trivial, right? So everything involves a non-trivial V. So all these factors will vanish if V is a vacuum. But let's say in this case, so the symmetry group is Z2. There's only one thing you have to specify, so that's just S. Now, if bulk is actually trivial, meaning that symmetry doesn't act in any non trivial manner in the bulk, well, it turns out that you can compute this circle cycle and get minus one. I mean, that on the other side of the boundary, 
if you condense the anion this way, it means the semion pair, semion S comma S actually carries a Z2 charge, you get an SPT phase on the other side. So that means that this bulk semion, in the absence of any non-trivial symmetry action, can actually eat the uh, Z2 leading to SPT. But then, if you actually choose the symmetry Z2 to act projectively on the semi on the bulk, then this doesn't happen. You cannot eat the SPT phase. What it turned out to be. And then, so the you story. at the boundary, what are you condensing for this? So it's always, uh, in this okay. case, it's just S. S, S, S. Ah, okay. Just one non trivial path. So, so, so I can think of it as having Lamar go and disengaging one side. You mean for this at the top? The top one, yes. So that, in that case, if you would say it's kind of obvious, you can form a boundary between S the input and the SCT phase of the double semi. This, this is double semi. But the, the, the body system is double semi. Oh, but, but it's not just gauging the right side. Oh, yeah, so, yeah. so, so Vinda, you have to gauge both of them right, in the right way. Um, so, so that's why you have to choose this W to be ones for this to happen. If you choose W to be S, I mean, you kind of have gauge one part of it. Not, not exactly, but you don't, you don't get this gap interface. Okay, there's a similar thing that happens for Z2 particle if you think about stacking SPTs. Basically, now it's kind of reversed. So except the, the case of a trivial virtualization, all the other cases, the symmetry in which particle can solve SPT, the Z2 SPT, except for trivial. No, 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 no matter which angle you yeah, no matter which fractionalization class you choose, I mean, there's no, for this particular fold setup, there's a, I condense the same set of minions. All right, so so that's that's uh, includes a part of SCP boundary. Um, so for the rest, so I guess getting <laughs> a little long. Uh, we're going to discuss uh, CFT. So any questions? All right, we're going to say. The question is when can the SPT be dissolved from the SCT? That's it. The question is when can an SPT be dissolved by an SCT? Right. That's something that you should be able to determine in the bulk, right? Not in terms of that, but maybe. Well, so yes, you should be able to determine the bulk, but that's equivalent to a condition that they have a gap on the preserving Yes, I agree, absolutely. Right. So if you just want to determine that from this formula, it means that you should be able to find some B map from G to A that will satisfy this one, that means you can resolve this SPT. But I can this also means you have a gap on it. So this is not the most general case, I'm considering a very special type of SPT, double SPT. Alright, so I'm going to now switch gears and talk about CFT now plus one. Uh, we probably have to move a little faster so that you can have lunch on time. Um, so the nice thing about CFT in one plus one, then there's a factorization to left and right, um, and then there's a so so you have left mover and the right mover. It's kind of decoupled, not, not exactly, but kind of decoupled. At least local operators, all the fixed stress tensors and the conserved charges, you can talk about them in either left half or right half. So you have two copies of say stress tensors T of Z and T of the bar. Then, if you have continuous symmetry, you, you will have currents. And these are also chiral currents, so J of Z and J of Z bar. Okay. So, we, we call all these objects, all these operators, the stress tensors, currents, and maybe some higher spin currents. So all these locally commuting homomorphic operators that depend only on Z, call them the chiral algebra. So, in some sense, this is the largest symmetry of the CFT. So if you only have stress tensor, that means the only symmetry, continuous symmetry you have is a conformal symmetry. But if you have other, say, uh, spin one current, you have some other B like symmetry. So once you have a local operator algebra, well, you can study the representations of this operator algebra, right? And that representation space is a Hilbert space of your CFT. But the special thing here is that you can, we can study the representation space of the chiral half of algebra, and I'm assuming the left and right have the same type of algebra in this case. So you can study, say, the representation space of well, the left part, all the right part. 
And then these are, the, we, we can find different representations, and they're labeled by the chiral primary operators. Okay, so I'm going to call this representation space H of A, labeled by the primaries, the chiral primaries. And physically, I have to glue the left and right into a non chiral 1 plus 1 plus 1 CFT. So you have to kind of specify how to glue the left to the right. And of course, in the end of the day, you just have a non chiral CFT. You have to kind of put the two filter space together. So in the, in the end of the day, it's not really a factorization. But on this factorization, so you have to have some kind, some kind of non trivial gluing between them. Okay. Sorry, what's the label of A? That's your A wrap? Uh, so, for example, in the case of like Western width models, these are A's are the highest weight representation. So then, the, uh, Hamilton, the full Hamiltonian you write? Like, this is not Hamiltonian, it's a Hilbert space. Sorry, sorry. The Hilbert space, you are only consider this diagonal pairing. Okay, so this for the example is like diagonal. So, you, okay. We should uh, have the same Yes, it seems to correspond to. The construction that the uh, top yes, end the diagonal must be diagonal. Right. So okay. Yes. Then um, uh, so you can you can study the CFT on the torus. So, so this pairing between left and right is usually specified by a thing function on torus. You, know, you have to multiply the characters of the left and right in a certain way to make sure that the thing function is modeling right. So that's the condition that is actually one plus one CFT. Um, so Chi of A is sort of a particular function restricted to one sector, a chiral sector. So a uh, diagonal one means this guy is just delta function and you get chi squared, chi, absolute value chi squared. Uh, so I'm going to assume that the, for most of the talk, this, for the rest of the talk, basically it's a diagonal particular function. Uh, but then uh, there's a theorem by Morris Seger that tells you that if your chiral algebra is much like extend, meaning that you include everything you can include into a chiral algebra, uh, this M is either diagonal or it, it's a responsible permutation of labels, responsible for logical symmetry. Okay. Then talk about category again, but then it's well known that there's a correspondence between the RCFTs, the rational CFT. So the ra rational word means that there's a finite number of properties, which is not necessarily the case in the CFT. So each rational CFT is, is naturally associated to a unique positive tensor category C. The reverse is not true. The one mind thought correspond to multiple edges. So the relations that face the mappings are basically chiral primaries of the rational CFT are the anions in this positive tensor category. And this, so if you think about the chiral MTC in the bulk, the boundary is the chiral CFT. You get a full CFT. You have to, for example, make another edge here to make it a really a strict possible uh, one D strip, or you can think about this folding. So there, this, these two pictures are really equivalent. So, um, so in other words, to really specific to really describe this one plus one CFT from the bulk point of view, not only you need MTC, you also need gluing between left and right, which is a blank algebra um, in MTC in this double MTC. And that also tells you what operators you have. So you can have local operators on each edge. You have local operators on this edge, local operators on the opposite edge. And these are the chiral algebra. Now you can tunnel one anion, a chiral primary. So chiral primary itself is a non-local operator. But then you can tunnel one from the top edge to the bottom edge. This is a, this string operator is a local operator in the 1D limit where we kind of build this as a poly by one dimensional system across some kind of boundary in the middle. So this is a primary in the one plus one CFT, non-chiral CFT, non-chiral primary. This line could be an invertible or non-invertible defect inserted in the picture. Very well. Okay. So, uh, so if we just take this simple folding without inserting any additional defect, this is a diagonal function. And you can do something on the boundary that gives you the so-called non-diagonal these are really physically distinct CFT because you can see the difference um, on, the, on the spectrum of the CFT. And I will, I will assume diagonal point function from now. Uh, okay, so now we want to think about symmetries in a CFT. Okay, 
So let's think about probably the most familiar set of CFT, the Western Witten model. So you have a regroup, group, uh, you can write a Western Witten model in terms of, say, elements of this uh, big group. Then really it's a Lie algebra, and then we choose a level K, integer level. So let's say, let's denote by G, this is a curl, curl G, curly G, that's a simply connected Lie group associated with that Lie algebra. But that's uniquely defined. Okay. Then this group might have a center that's called a Z. So as we think about the symmetry of the Western Union witness CFT, well, the symmetry is really given by this group. So, so there's a left uh, copy of the lead group acting on the left over and then the right copy of the There's one copy of acting on the right, but then you have to mod out the diagonal, kind of an axial version of the diagonal element. So all the centers that act axially on the left and right, the G and G inverse, that you have to model now because they don't act on any local vectors. So in the simple case, well, in the familiar case of SU2, say level one, this is just SO4. SU2 cross SU2 mod Z2, this is SO4. And if you have time versus symmetry, that would be SO4. So to specify how the global symmetry acts on the CFT, you just have kind of have to tell me you know, how the G is embedded into the symmetry. In this case, that's a full description. But let's break it down a little bit. So, um, on one hand, since the chiral algebra plays an important role, so first we can specify how the G sort of acts on chiral algebra. So now the chiral algebra, so the left one is the Lie group. The symmetry really is Lie group. The simply connected Lie group modeled out by the center on the left. On the right, you have a similar group. So the chiral algebra basically has the symmetry. Now we can we can we can just write down how the G acts on these operators in the chiral algebra that, that's equivalent to given specifying this homomorphism. So that almost determines all the reps, all the reps of the primary under G, but up to a chiral center, because these two groups actually differ by one copy of the center. So you have to supply an additional piece of information that is how the G maps into an additional missing chiral center of the lead group from this guy to really get, get the whole symmetry group. So in the bulk language, it means that once we know how the G X on chiral algebra, it actually determines the fractionalization class or the reps on the chiral primaries, the projected class of these chiral primaries. Then the remaining freedom is just a map from G to the chiral center. Then the center, so then of day, up, up to this, uh, well, on top of this action on chiral algebra, while well, you just have a map from G to the center, which means you can attach a one dimensional wrap to each primary. And it turns out that the center the center group is exactly the same as a group of the anions in uh, the G level K transcendence U property. So the general story is that suppose I have uh, RCFT. And associated to the RCFT, I have a chiral order tensor category, and the beta anions is from the group A. So I can always first specify how the G acts on the chiral algebra. But once I determine how the chiral algebra transforms under G, the remaining part is just a Bayesian base vector given by H of 1 G to map to A. And also, the action on chiral algebra determines class, projective class of a chiral primary. So, in different kind of language, once the G actually, once we know how G acts on chiral algebra, the remaining freedom is a topological defect line, because it has to commute with chiral algebra. Because of the symmetry, these defect lines have to be invertible, and all of them can be classified by this map from G to A. Okay, so, there's actually a precise correspondence with the picture that I drew on a few slides ago where you attach a billion anion to a defect. So in this case, attach a, a billion defect line to the actual symmetry defect line, the 2D CFT. And um, you can turn the same crank and show that now there's a red anomaly because I'm not, I'm not telling you what anomalies already given by this G transformation on chiral algebra. For example, G can just act on the left part and not act on the right part. That gives a chiral anomaly. So that 
this part itself could give you some total number, right? So what I what what I can compute using this formula is the change of anomaly once you pick these additional logical defect lines, real defect lines. So that's why I say it's a red anomaly. So I'm not computing the anomaly associated to this part. I'm only associated compute anomalies given by you know attaching these additional faces to the part. That's given by the same formula. So there are two cases where this formula becomes kind of an absolute anomaly. In one case, obviously, if G commutes, G itself commutes with whole chi algebra, so delta echelon chi algebra, then this is the formula. And actually, in that case, you can say this projective class, pressure identity class, W is trivial, so all you get is F simple. <coughs> the other case, at the left and right, transform exactly the same way, opposite way, corresponding to this holding picture. So there's a, in this case, even though the left and right could transform non trivially under symmetry, there's no anomaly associated with this, uh, this transformation. Then this formula also gives us no anomaly. So in these two cases, relative becomes absolute because you can identify the identity, trivial one. This is. The CFT has this large emergent symmetry, right? Sorry? The CFT has this large emergent symmetry, right? Right. Can you not compute? I mean, can you compute the, the cycle of that emergent symmetry group? Yes, of course you can. And they just, right, so the point is that um, that part you cannot determine from the MTC equation. So only this relative part you can determine from what the transparent group. But this relative part doesn't itself give like the whole emergent symmetry group doesn't appear? Or? Uh, as far as I can tell, no. So there's some anomaly you can compute by looking at the local operator algebra. Then on top of that, you can compute this anomaly using only the MTC information. That one, you have to look at the CFT. The CFT actually has more information than MTC. Right? That, that's missing from the, the bulk. But I thought that you should be able to just say, OK, I have this big emergent symmetry group, uh, and it has some anomaly. And then my actual physical symmetry group just the homomorphism into the emergent symmetry. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. You, from, go back. You, can, you, can, you can also do it that way. Like in the case of West Moon the Witten model, right? You can do it that way. But I'm only separating that into some subclasses labeled by first how the current algebra transform on the G. Then there's additional classes labeled by this uh, invertible defect lines. Of course, you can just compute directly in the case of West Witten from this mapping of G to the whole. But there's one part of it that can be just read out from the MTC. That's this part. Yes. Can you explain like relative anomaly maybe to Subir? Oh. <laughs> so <laughs> the difference between two anomalies of the same spot. It just means that I cannot there's some part of it I cannot compute. I can only compute the difference between two things. Okay. So, 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 it's still so, 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 some global symmetry. Right. But it's kind of admitting that I'm not good enough to, using MTC, I'm not good enough to actually compute the whole thing. Or basically, I believe that MTC doesn't know about this part, so you cannot compute this part, but then you can compute the difference when you change your, all the transformation of the primary by a one dimensional graph, by some common number. This is what now we do that in two dimensions, right? Maybe, are you trying to compare maybe two MTC data such that they are different by some 3D SPT? Well, so the, the point that this is really the same computation we did for the gap boundary of SPT and SPT. That's exactly the same computation we did. And I, I don't even need to do any work. This is the same point. All right, so now uh, I have probably a few minutes left. So let's let's discuss some application of this form. Right, the CFT has a long literature. Uh, so I'm I feel like probably everything I said, you can find something similar in the literature in the 80s. But hopefully, this gives you a, a simplified perspective on some of these computations. So, first, F the G, in the, in the case where I can actually calculate absolute anomaly, and I don't have to worry about this relative issue, in one case, G commutes with chi algebra. So, the whole chi algebra commutes with G, so that's kind of a simple case. In that case, the bulk is trivial as a trivial projective class, so you just get this F symbol. And where 
this happens, one whole family of CFT where this happens, the polynomial model, because power algebra is just a bit of solo algebra, and we know in the quantum field theory, global symmetry must commute with stress tensor, so in the models have power algebra commuting with any unitary symmetry that you can have. Uh, in that case, you can, well, then the remaining task is just to identify the set of abelian anions, right? So that means you identify kind of a, a simple current. The terminology probably for Western Britain model, but just refer to this abelian anion in the chiral MTC. So um, let's consider the minimum model labeled by integer m. So m has to be greater than 3, greater than equal to 3. So m for 3 in the convention is IC. The next one is tricritical, the next one is pots. Well, not pots. Okay. <laughs> Not pots, but related pots. So if you if you look and the primaries are labeled by two integers r and s. So one goes from r goes from r goes from one to n minus one, s goes from one to n. And there's some symmetry between them. Anyway, so you can find exactly one abelian anion in the chiral MTC associated to a minimal model, and that's n minus one one. So if you look at the cock table, let's see the corner, um, and you can compute the spin. Of this guy, just using the formula, you can find the first volume of uh, well, in the, in the, so that's a Chinese edition. So you can find in the <laughs> <laughs> you can find the yellow book. You can find this formula. You just compute the spin, and it turns out that it's either integer or half integer. Okay. Um, yeah, yellow volume has one point. Yellow book has one point. All right, but then in any case, there's only one abelian anion, so it must be C two. No abelian anion can fuse it. An F symbol is one can show up, F symbol just one. So in this case, this relative to the nominee is always trivial because this F symbol is identically one. No matter what you choose for it. Actually, you can actually from this V, it tells you that minimal model only has E2 symmetry. That we kind of know because well, there's a Ginsburg Landau description of minimal model in terms of multi critical kind of by four plus by six plus by A theory and the symmetry there is only E2. So that's consistent with what we read out from this of this kind of uh, abstract approach. Okay. Moreover, for other CFTs, uh, if we assume that G commutes with higher algebra, actually play some constraint on what this guy can be. Because there's a nice, there's a kind of interesting result that you can, for, for uh, MTC, you can always find a page in which the F symbols are just F plus minus one for the abelian angles. So that means whatever you compute, okay, whatever this V, choose, this guy is going to be plus minus one. So that means this, this class, this uh, circle cycle, must be order two. For example, you cannot have a C3 SPT edge if the G commutes with cut out. And not every order two can be realized in this way. So, oh my God. <laughs> so you check uh, symmetries only of local operators, is that correct? If you're only interested in local scaling operators in the CFT, you wouldn't look at this string? Yes. Correct. Well, but the point that symmetry action on the chiral operators are fixed by the action of G on the chiral on, on the chiral. You don't have to talk about application. But I think what you mean is that, say, it's a disorder operator, you can carry the charge. Yeah, so that part of the model. This the logical defect lines called carry additional symmetries. So some of them are determined by the action of chiral algebra, but then there might be a different degree of freedom corresponding to what you can see. Only the top of the lobby of diagonal minimal model. Yeah, yeah, it's all for diagonal uh, minimal model. Although non diagonal ones, I can actually deal with case by case. Uh, a small question. Um, the Z2 symmetry <coughs> are acting on, you're saying, acting on the left and right chiral algebra, uh, one as wrap, the other as a uh, conjugate wrap. For the Z2, here, the Z2, for minimal model, Z2 doesn't act on chiral algebra. Okay. For example, in the case of icing, the Z2 just put a minus one in front of a sigma plot on sigma yeah, spin, but well, sigma operator, but that doesn't act on chi algebra because it's only the stress tensor. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, for the, and then I'm going to discuss this anomaly that's probably the most interesting to us in the next matter for the one plus one systems. So that's a vicious madness anomaly, meaning that you actually have a spin chain where each side transformed as a projected wrap of some internal symmetry group. And we also impose value translation symmetry. 
So yeah, so set up that you have a kind of some kind of internal centrifuge time station, and then each side is a projected red from that tube, given by H of two cosine. The projected class is given by cosine. So uh, so now we kind of says if you increase the length of a tube by one, well you get an additional projected red. So in the the use of language, I can insert the translation flux to the low energy theory, I should see an additional projected red. CFT language like the twisted sector, twisted by the translation symmetry, should be projected red of the symmetry, of the internal symmetry. Alright, so we can apply the formula you know, with all assumptions I make diagonal and whatever. And suppose GX on the left and right, chiral algebra in this kind of axial way. Then this is so we can from that point we can show this new that tells you which rep you have on your side has to be in the same class as this guy. So new of T of X is kind of a beating invertible line but you associate to the translation defect. And this the right hand side of the equation just tells you what what projected rep carried by this translation defect. That's exactly what we just said for the LSM number. Not saying anything more than this. The only additional information that we supplied is that this guy has to be a beating angle. So if you want to make sure that your suppose this spin chain realizes a CFT, right? So to check whether the LSM anomaly is correctly realized, all you need to do is to go to the list of primaries and look for the beating ones, meaning that these primaries actually have one dimension one, simple currents. You see whether the, whether you can find one that carries a correct web. Once you find that, that means you can do it. And it will also tell you what are the lattice momentum of each of the primary. So it becomes a very simple game of checking the representation of the kind of simple currents in CT. And so basically it just means this guy has to carry the same rep, the same projected class of rep in the side field of space. Uh, and then this guy is an invertible defect by corresponding unit translation, so it just means you have to check the simple current in the chiral RCFT. And grading of V, this whole thing tells you that is momentum of the primaries. Once you fix this, you kind of know the whole, uh, know the, all the pump numbers of the CFT. So let me give one example. So, um, so let's consider a CUN fundamental spin chain. So it's a spin chain with a CUN symmetry, I mean, strictly speaking, projected SUN symmetry. And each side has a fundamental rep of SUN. <laughs> so the natural CFT you consider in this spin chain is SUN level K, right? Western the model. And the simple currents in any of these SUN level K form a Z angle. And the generator is this rep. So this is the banking label of the rep. So if you set K to 1, this is the fundamental rep. And so the level K, 0, 0, all the way to the last one, K, is projectively, the projective class is equivalent to K copies of the fundamental. So now you want to look for among these set of simple currents one that carries the right rep, which is a fundamental rep. So if K is one, you already have it. So the fundamental the generator of this step is the fundamental rep. So that already satisfies the condition. If K is greater than one, you have to solve this uh, equation, the uh, kind of a modular equation that K times J, so J is a label in this end group. This tells you the projective class of this rep it has to be 1 log n. So you have to be able to solve this for j, so that's only solvable when k and n are co-prime. Of course, you always have a solution when k is 1. That's indeed the case, because let's see when high the model is actually integrable, means you can solve it by beta n sub, and the ground state is s one level 1. And in this case, well, Conjecture and minimal central charge in systems n minus 1 realized by this S1 CFT. And there's actually a generalization of the story where each side transforms at a symmetric rank m tensor. You can also write down a beta n sub solvable model and show that the ground state is SU1 level k. In that case, the equation has to be modified as one level m. In that case, you have to modify the equation replacing the 1 with an m and solvable if and only if k. Uh, greatest common <coughs> divisor of k and n divides n, in particular when k is n. All right, so it seems like there's actually a lot of constraints coming from um, on the CFT. So there was this uh, 
beautiful work um, that constrained the dimension of light density to all the primary rays in a CFT with a tokenomy. Uh, and then there was also a couple of years ago, there was a conjectural bound on the CFT that gives you a critical theory between SVT to trivial transition that bounds is given by log two of the dimension of the edge state of the SVT. Okay, what's the status of this conjecture? It seems quite compelling. Now, uh, there's another conjecture, thank you, that is LSM anomaly actually bound the central charge. For example, if you have SUN spin chain, uh, the conjecture that C has to be greater than n minus 1. So in this case, it's actually stronger than this bound because of the additional symmetry I have the translation symmetry. Now, I can break SUN down to Zn cross Zn. It seems like the same bound still holds. This n minus 1 is kind of natural once you actually have full SUN symmetry because we have a concurrent algebra. And the SUN level 1, the simplest one of them, has this uh, n minus 1. So it becomes a little more subtle for the other degrees. It's always not always given by the central charge of the level one theory. And we also worked out an example where it's a fermion chain with an unitary quite low symmetry. It seems like the minimal theory can write down as the same charge equals two. So maybe there's even a bound if you specify the ball defect line category. Okay, so <laughs> already uh, probably going over the time. Thanks for attention. More questions? So as you go on one, you say this is a solvable and then using beta insights. Sorry? For SUN level one, right. you say this is solvable and then you can use beta insights. Right. And then you write out single charge. So my understanding is safety, right? Well, so the spin model can be solved by beta insights. And from an answer, you can check that it's Spectrum agrees, the large spectrum agrees with uh, SUN level 1 CFT. That's what I mean. Okay. Yeah. SUN level 1 just solved. It's a question of rhythm model. No, yeah, we can solve that. Yeah. But the, the lattice model is can be solved by beta okay. Good. And you can check that they match it. Any more comments, questions? So, why invite? So, just like uh, this uh, yellow CFT book has the Chinese version and English version. So the English version of the convention <laughs> is like this, but uh, precisely it's Chen Mo. <laughs> they should pronounce it more. <laughs> Sensible that edition. So the cheap, cheap Chinese edition of Yellow Book actually has two more. Yeah. <laughs> That's the one, uh, one I have. But, but the English name is kind of cheap version of Chinese. <laughs> uh, let's thank. Uh, which one do you like? Bones and or Mom again. Bones and Mom. So let's go for long. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, the dimension of the FTT at So, so like, if you have, like, double day,